Hello and welcome to Explore TBR, the channel dedicated to finding, mapping and exploring what remains of the historic Thailand to Burma Railway. This video covers around 2 kilometers of the old railway between Tarso and Tonchan and continues onwards from where my Tarso video left off. So if you haven't watched that one, you may want to have a look. There's a link in the top right corner of the screen. There are no stations along this section, no notable historic features like Hellfire Pass. It's simply a length of single line railway. What is notable about it, however, is the number of bridges and the size of these bridges. I read somewhere, but I can't find where. If you know, please leave a comment below. I read that the Thailand Burma Railway could be thought of as a railway of bridges, since there were close to 700 bridges along its length. The short section we're going to cover in this video is a perfect example of that, with 12 bridges along this 2 kilometers of railway. So the theme of this video is the bridges, here at Tonshan and more generally all along the railway. Before I go any farther, I'd like to take a moment to thank and give credit to two people who I've met online recently and who have been enormously helpful to me. In no particular order, thank you to Stefan, who runs the Facebook page called The Thailand Burma Railway 1942-1945. Also thank you to Alex, as he asked me to call him. He runs two Facebook pages, Thai Burma Railway and Thai Burma Railway Explorers Group. Stefan and Alex helped me a lot with more detailed maps of the railway than I had, as well as the British Army's Detailed Interpretive Report, or DIR for short, a detailed write-up listing all of the features of the railway, including bridges, cuttings, stations, and so on, with mile points working from Tan Buzayat towards Nong Pladuk. I can't thank them enough. If you are interested in the Thailand Burma Railway, you must have a look at their Facebook pages. There is a huge amount of information there. I've left links to their pages in the description below. Back to the railway and the Tonchan bridges. Tarso Station was located at the 130 km point along the railway, and after crossing the trestle at the current Sayak Noi waterfall, the railway made a large sweeping curve to the north towards Tonchan. The railway was climbing up a hillside and needed to cross many ravines along the way. In this British Army map of the railway, you can see the many bridges along the curved section leaving Tarso. In the 9 kilometers between Tarso Station and Tonshan Station, there were 24 bridges, with most of them closer to Tarso. On Google Maps, you can see that same curve northwards in the trace of the railway highlighted here in red, as it leaves Sayok Noi, and also all of the ravines carving into the hillside which required all the bridges. The latest version of the railway map published by the Thailand Burma Railway Center, or TBRC for short, shows a POW camp named Tonshan Bridge Camp, just north of the railway line along this stretch. Presumably the POWs in this camp were responsible for building these bridges. A map of this same Tonshan Bridge Camp was drawn just after the war by POW Jim Ray. The drawing can be found at the Weary Dunlop Memorial Park near Home Putoi Resort. This map indicates that the camp was located along a stream and a path down to a bridge the POWs called Bridge Number 19. Then there were five more bridges before another one called Bridge Number 13. There must be a reason why Jim Ray specifically noted Bridge Number 13 on his map, but not the other five. My guess is that this was the beginning of their work zone. The number of bridges in this area suggests that the numbers 13, 19 and so on started counting somewhere around Tarso Station or the Sayok Noi Waterfall. The path to Tonshan Bridge Camp joined up with the Japanese road which roughly paralleled the highway. To the left was Tonshan Central and to the right Tonshan South Camp was about 2 kilometers away. Also the map shows the railway as a straight line and roughly parallel to the road. But we know now this is not correct in this area. And here's the problem. The POWs of course only knew their immediate surroundings, where they lived and worked. And the brutally harsh conditions of their imprisonment didn't give them the opportunity to look around and explore and get their bearings. So as good as these camp maps are, and how fortunate we are to have them, the features on these maps, as well as distances, angles, bearings, etc., can only be taken as approximate. These camp maps are often very difficult to reconcile with modern satellite maps. Nevertheless, let's remember these three numbers, 
440 yards or quarter of a mile perpendicular from the railway and two kilometers up the road from Tonshan South Camp and bridge number 19 being downstream from the camp. Tonshan South Camp was here on the stream above the Sayok Noi waterfall and the red dashed line is the Japanese road which roughly paralleled the railway. You can see on Google Maps that the Japanese road has evolved into this road here. Tonshan South Camp was located where this clearing is today. So two kilometers up the road would be around here, and if we count 19 bridges up the railway from Tarso Station and then go 440 yards into the jungle towards the road, we arrive at this area quite a bit farther north. At this point, Stefan helped me with his Magic Eye in the Sky project, where he is able to look around an area as if we're back in 1945 again, and he showed me what is most likely this Tonchan Bridge Camp. The better built structures in the Japanese part of the camp are readily visible, although the British tents are obscured by trees, if they're even still there. The camp had possibly been abandoned after the railway was completed two years earlier. But the location of these structures suggests that this camp was even farther north, around here. Also, it shows that the nearest bridge to the camp, which Jim Ray labeled as bridge number 19 on his drawing, crosses this ravine here. In the Tarso video, we walked westwards from the highway to this point here. But in this video, we'll start where the railway crosses this dirt track about one kilometer in from Highway 323, and we'll explore back southwards for the next 1.75 kilometers of the railway. This is the point where the dirt track crosses over the railway trace. The Tonshan Bridge Camp is a few hundred meters north of this dirt road. There's a small clearing here, and you can see the railway running north and south on either side of the road. Each of these black and white segments works out to around 20 meters on the ground. Photo 1 shows the view from the road looking down the railway line towards the south. Walking southwards, within about 50 meters you reach the site of the first bridge. This bridge was known by the British Armed Forces during the war as Bridge Q603. These Q numbers were new to me and explained to me by Stefan. The Q letter came from the railway route. Every railway route in Japanese-held territory had a letter, and the Tanbuzayat to Bangkok link was assigned the letter Q. The British had a detailed survey of the railway compiled from aerial reconnaissance photography down the entire length of the line. This was written up in the Detailed Interpretive Report, or in this case, DIR number 87, and the photos were also used to revise these British Army maps. The report starts with some introductory information about the route and then begins at the Tanbuzayat end of the line, describing the Tanbuzayat railway facilities. It then works down the line with a description of all the features along the railway, bridges, cuttings, embankments, stations, and so on. So, bridge Q603 where we are now is the 603rd bridge from Tanbuzayat, listed as a 75-foot long viaduct over a stream and gorge but most of these streams were only running during the rainy season. The mileage here indicates 165 miles from Tanbuzayat, which is not quite correct, it's a bit low, but keep in mind that this report was compiled entirely from a huge number of aerial photos, with no actual measurements on the ground. The map reference numbers and coordinates refer to these British Army maps, but again there are some slight errors and typos in places. While we're here, from Stefan's project, the bridge called Bridge Number 19 down the stream from the Tonchan Bridge Camp is identifiable as Q601. The other bridge number 13 in Jim Ray's map would have been Q607. The POWs at Tonchan South Camp above the waterfall at Sayok Noi probably worked from that point up to bridge number 12, which was Q608 across this ravine, about halfway to the Tonchan Bridge Camp further to the north. The POWs in the Tonchan Bridge Camp probably started their work at bridge 13, which was Q607 at this ravine here, and continued onwards past their camp and north towards Tonchan Central. Back on the railway, most of the bridge sites in this area still have the concrete footings along the floor of the ravine, complete with the iron bolts which were used to secure the bridge timbers to the concrete foundations. Photo 2 shows one of these bolts in the concrete at bridge Q603. 
Working south again, we soon arrive at Bridge Q604, a 60-foot long viaduct over a stream and gorge. Embankments lead up to both ends of the bridge. Again, the concrete footings with iron bolts are still intact, shown in photo 3. Still farther south, we come to Bridge Q605, a very high 95-foot long viaduct over a stream and gorge. Again, embankments lead up to both ends of the bridge. The north end of the bridge steps down a series of concrete footings, but the south side is a sheer limestone cliff, which is actually undercut by the stream at the bottom, which was dry when I was there in June. Photo 4 shows this cliff face looking south down the concrete steps. Looking across at this sheer rock face is a sobering reminder of how difficult it must have been to build these bridges. One of the Japanese railway soldiers, Kazuo Tamayama, wrote a book called Railway Men in the War. Written from a Japanese perspective, it obviously contains little about the appalling conditions the Allied POWs endured while working on the railway, but it does contain a lot of information about the engineering, construction and operation of the railway. In this book, Tamayama describes in detail how these bridges were built. He writes about how the Japanese plans for the bridges were adapted from the American Merriman Wigan standard practice for timber structures. The diagram on the left, on display at the TBRC in Kanchanaburi, shows the basic design of the Japanese timber bridges built along the Thailand-Burma Railway. Note the dimensions of the timbers, 12 by 12 inches for the main vertical columns and horizontal beams, and 3 by 10 inch timbers for the cross braces. The diagram on the right is from the Japanese archives at the website shown on the screen. It shows another Japanese plan for a trestle pier. The Japanese characters below the diagram describe the bridge being designed to limit the damage to the bridge from a bombing attack. It talks of flying bridge timbers and parts, which is very interesting and we'll come back to this in a moment. The structure on the left side of the bridge was built to protect each bridge pier from floating trees and logs in the water. The arrow shows the direction of the river current. This diagram shows a plan from the American Great Northern Railway in 1931, based on the same Merriman Wigan standard, and you can immediately see the similarities. These are two of the actual bridges along the railway. The bridge on the left is the immediately recognizable three-tier bridge near Hintock, and on the right it's believed to be near Kinsayok. As you can see in the photos, the Japanese engineers often added additional bracing on the sides of the taller bridges to strengthen them, especially around curves. Thanks again to Alex for providing many of the higher resolution photos of the bridges. Back on the railway, photo 5 shows the enormous size of the embankment leading up to the south end of the bridge. The embankment is faced with large chunks of broken limestone, presumably from the cuttings a few hundred meters farther down the line. Continuing southwards around a slight bend to the east, we come to one of several original sleepers still lodged in the ballast, shown in photo 6. Soon we come to bridge Q606, a 60-foot viaduct over a stream and gorge, again with embankments leading up to both sides. In the ravine, you can find one of the concrete foundations which held the side braces in place against the surrounding rock, shown in photo 7. The timber was wedged against the surrounding rock, and concrete was poured around it, holding it securely in place. The timber has long since decayed away, leaving just the round hole in the concrete. I mentioned a moment ago that the bridges were intentionally built in such a way to limit damage in the event of a bombing attack. It was mentioned in the Japanese bridge diagram, and Tamayama also talks about this in his book, how the bridges were held together using mostly clamps and what looked like large staples, shown here. These photos show a mock-up of the bridge construction inside the TBRC. You can see the staples holding the timbers together. Tamayama talks about how the bridges were frequently bombed and had to be rebuilt, some of them as many as six times. Tamayama explains the bridges were built this way to minimize damage to the timbers during a bombing attack. Built this way, the bridges were strong enough to carry the weight of the trains, but weak enough that they would simply fly apart under a bombing attack with the timbers scattered around but relatively undamaged. The undamaged components were then collected and quickly reassembled and stapled or clamped back together. In many places, extra bridge timbers were prepared in advance, so in the event of a bombing raid, the bridges could be repaired even faster. 
I initially thought the Japanese used these staples because it was all they had, that they had nothing better. But it's actually more accurate to say that under the circumstances there really was nothing better. Back to the railway again, we move on southwards and come to a shallow cutting around one meter deep, followed by a low embankment. The center of this embankment has a dip in the surface, suggesting either subsidence or more likely a collapsed culvert under the line. Photo 8 shows this point in the embankment. After another short cutting, we arrive at bridge Q607, a 65-foot viaduct over a stream and gorge. Again, there are embankments leading up to both ends of the bridge. This bridge Q607 is the bridge number 13 in Jim Ray's camp drawing. Beyond this bridge, we reach a long cutting around 120 meters long and 2 meters deep. Photo 9 was taken in this cutting, looking southeast towards Tarso. A second cutting around 80 meters long and again 2 meters deep follows that, and then we arrive at bridge Q608, a truly enormous bridge, 125 feet long over a stream in a very deep gorge. There is a very high embankment faced with stones leading up to the north end. Photo 10, looking back to the north side, shows the size of this embankment. Only the embankment, not including the concrete steps down into the ravine. That's the unstoppable Ajarn Andy again, at the top of the embankment for scale. Photo 11 shows the enormous slope and concrete steps looking up the south end of the bridge to the embankment at the top. Photo 12 shows the neat stonework facing the side of the south approach embankment and the concrete step which supported the bridge timbers. Along the next 250 meters, we leave the Q608 embankment, walk through alternating cutting, then embankment, then cutting, then round a bend to the east along the embankment leading up to bridge Q609, a 75-foot viaduct over a stream and gorge. Photo 13 looks eastward at the far end of the bridge. Again, you can see the huge stone embankment and concrete bridge foundations. Walking almost due east towards Tarso, we leave the embankment to bridge Q609 behind, through another short cutting and arrive at bridge Q610, an 85-foot viaduct over a deep gorge and stream, also with embankments at either end. Photo 14 shows the sheer size of this bridge, looking up the east slope of the ravine towards the embankment at the very top. It's quite sad that these photos don't do justice to the colossal size of these bridges. You really need to see them in person to appreciate the enormity of the job it would be to build them. Continuing east along the line, we cross a short embankment over low ground, then enter a long cutting two meters deep. Photo 15 shows this cutting looking west. Finally, we reach the other side of the gorge, which was the fourth bridge in the Tarso video. This was bridge Q611, 105 feet long over a deep gorge and stream. The walls of this gorge are vertical rock faces, and it's not possible to climb down and up the other side. A long detour around to the north is necessary. Just for completeness, I'm going to carry on to the access point at Highway 323. From bridge Q611, the line runs east along flat ground over the low 50-foot long bridge Q612, shown in photo 16 looking west. The line passes through a long cutting before reaching bridge Q613, a 45-foot viaduct over a stream and gorge. Photo 17 shows this bridge looking west, and photo 18 shows the view facing east. Eastwards into another long cutting, we come to the last bridge, Q614. This bridge was 135 feet long over another very deep gorge with a stream. Like Q611, the walls of the gorge are vertical rock faces and a long detour is necessary around the gorge. After this bridge, we pass through a long and deep cutting shown in photo 19 looking west. Finally, at the end of the cutting, we reach a mountain of rubble pushed into the cutting during construction of the highway. Climbing up and over this pile, we reach the roadside at Highway 323. This is where you might alight from the bus or car or motorbike or however you reach this end of the trail. Incidentally, this ravine here where the railway trace crosses the highway was the site of Bridge Q615, but there is no trace of it, or even the railway line for that matter, at this point. So how best to get to this area and start exploring? Well, that depends on how much you want to do in one day. This is Google Maps with my GPS tracker file and waypoints overlaid. 
If you remember in the Tarso video, we left the highway at this point and followed the line through the cutting here, and now you can see how far I needed to detour safely around the ravine where bridge Q614 stood, then across two more smaller ravines here, and stopped at the fourth ravine which was so deep and wide you can't see the bottom of it or the other side. This was bridge Q611, and getting around this ravine requires a long detour north around the edge. You can see how far I got before I gave up and turned back. My GPS unit at the time had no map screen, so I couldn't see where I was or how much further I needed to go. When I got home and loaded the GPX file into Google Maps, I was disappointed to find how close I actually got to the end of the ravine. So it is actually possible to start at the highway and push west and north all the way to the dirt road where this video starts. Stefan has done it this way. But these ravines are no joke and you need to be careful. The alternative is to do this section first, double back to the highway and travel a few kilometers up the highway and a kilometer down this dirt road and walk south from there all the way back to the opposite side of the Q611 bridge, as shown in this video. You'll have to decide for yourself what's the best way to do it. I'll show some footage of what you'll see along this section as I talk about how best to get here and do this hike. To get here you have a number of options. First, if you decide to break this hike up into two parts like I did it, then the best way is probably to rent a motorbike in Kanchanaburi and ride up to Namtok, or Sayok Noi as it's properly called. Park the bike at the roadside near the cutting. In the description below you can find Google Map GPS links to all the points mentioned in this video. From this point, walk into Q611 and back to your bike, then ride up the highway to the dirt road. It is possible for a motorbike to make it down the dirt road to the railway line, so this will shorten the hike quite a lot. Then you can easily walk down the line to the other side of Q611. If you want to travel by bus, this is possible, but apparently these buses are not as frequent or reliable as they used to be, so best check the schedule in Kanchanaburi beforehand. Otherwise, you may be in for an unexpectedly long wait for a bus. Flag down the bus anywhere along Sangchudo Road through Kanchanaburi and tell the conductor you're going to Sayok Noi. The bus ride will take around an hour and a quarter, and then alight at the roadside just beyond the town and walk up the railway line to Q611 and back. But when you get back to the highway, you may be in for a long wait for the next bus to continue north. Then when you alight at the dirt road, you have a long walk down to the railway and through to Q611 and all the way back. And then you may have another long wait for a bus back to Kanchanaburi. The last bus seems to be around 4.30 in the afternoon now, so make sure you leave enough time and don't get stranded. You would want to check the bus schedule very carefully before leaving Kanchanaburi. I don't recommend doing it this way because you may end up waiting for hours for buses and you may not even be able to finish the hike. Second, if you are an accomplished hiker or part mountain goat and decide to walk the entire length of the trail from the highway near Sayok Noi all the way to the dirt road at the north end, including the long detours around the Q614 and 611 ravines, then the best way would probably be to take bus 8203 from Kanchanaburi, alight at the roadside just beyond Sayok Noi town and walk the length of the railway, including the detours around the ravines, and arrive at the dirt road then walk the last kilometer back up the dirt road to Highway 323. From there you can flag down the next bus back to Kanchanaburi. Another way you could do this is to hire a car and driver for a full day, which costs around 1,500 baht as of mid-2023. The driver will be happy to drop you anywhere and either wait for you to come back or drive somewhere else to pick you up at a different point. Any of the hotels should be able to arrange a car and driver for you, for around the same price. And third, if you're a really, really keen hiker, or just enjoy pain, then you could feasibly walk all the way from the Namtok train station, around the bend, past the waterfall, to the cutting at the highway, then start along the railway line and walk the entire length through to the dirt road and back out to the highway at the north end. You would want to take the early morning train from Kanchanaburi up to Namtok, do the hike, and then flag down a bus back to Kanchanaburi. If you do it this way, then check out my Tarso video to see how to get from Namtok train station to the cutting beside the highway. In all honesty, I think this is too much for one day, but you know your limits better than anyone, and it's up to you to decide which option is best for you. As always, the difficulty will depend on when you go. 
During the wet season, it will likely be very overgrown and tough going. Less so in the dry season, but still quite difficult. So plan for the worst and wear heavy clothes. There is no food or drink along the trail, so bring lots of water and a snack with you. There are shops and restaurants along the highway in Sayok Noi, where you can buy hot meals and cold drinks and snacks. As always, please be very careful when you're hiking. Because this is a long and difficult hike, take it easy and pace yourself. There are many places where bad falls are possible down steep banks. Even worse, the vertical rock faces at Q611 and Q614 pose a significant danger, so stay well away from the edge. Know your limits and don't take risks. Bring a buddy, or if you're alone, let someone know exactly where you're going and when you expect to return. Like I've said many times before, this railway is a site of historic importance. Please don't take anything and please don't leave any litter behind. Remember the thousands of people who died under appalling conditions constructing this railway and treat what remains of it with the respect it deserves. So that's it. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you found this interesting or informative. If so, please give the video a like and feel free to subscribe and check out the other videos on different sections of the railway. And if you do get out here to the Tonchan bridges and explore this area, let me know how it went in the comments below. I'd really like to hear from you. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next video.